Good morning, Huntington Chapel and guests online. We have another beautiful day. It has a little nip in the air. But God has blessed us with a beautiful day. And in case you are not from New England, the leaves are turning and it is harvest season. And not just in the physical sense. It is harvest season in the spiritual sense. And there are many out there that don't know our Lord and Savior. Psalm 67 addresses this issue specifically. If you please would stand with me as we read God's word. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways, O Lord, may be known on all the earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, O God, and may all the people praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the people justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God, and may all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. Yes. God will bless us. And all the earth will fear him. Please join with me as we open our service in prayer. Father God, we thank you that your plan is not to destroy us, but to bless us. Father, we ask that you would bless this time together with you, that we would indeed praise you. Father, we thank you for how you bless us and how you're going to bless us, as well as all the earth. And we give you thanks for all of these things through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Are you ready to have some fun? Hallelujah. Let's enter into the presence of our Lord with joy in our hearts. First song he's going to sing is Holy, Holy, Holy.
hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed come sit at the table come taste the grace there's a west for the weary a west that endures earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure lay down your burdens lay down your shame all who You know, it is an important thing to remember every now and then because sometimes we allow ourselves to get so beat up. When we come before the Lord, we always bow our heads. But I also love this, that he is the lifter of your heads. And as we come before him, it is we come before him in, in humility, in, in humbleness. But as we come and we see him and we... You need to know that he wants us to gaze in him, and he is the lifter of our heads. And so as we come and we let the Spirit do its job, he begins to work amongst us. He comes and he gives a new direction, but he also wants to reaffirm his love and his delight in you. And I pray as we sing these songs that we realize no matter what blessing he gives us, the greatest blessing is him. The greatest blessing is his love, is his presence in our lives. Hallelujah. We just praise his holy name. Thank you. 
We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night. We've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight. We've all run to things, things we know just ain't right. There's a better life. There's a better life. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. You got chains. You don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want to. I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just say. Song, take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you're enough. Take me back to where we started. I 
just want you and nothing else and nothing else nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else will do I just want you I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings. No, I'm not here for blessings. Jesus, Jesus, you don't know. just want you I just want you and nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do I just want you and nothing else and nothing else and nothing else will do I just want presence, for your mighty hand, for how you meet us in every area of our lives, every situation, every condition, every illness. Lord God, we thank you that you are constant, that you are and will always be God, and you will always be mighty and holy and just. We thank you, Lord, for being here today and for being with us always as we walk through this journey, through this path. Lord God, let us just sit in your presence and be awestruck by your majesty. Thank you, God, that you are good. So good. We praise your mighty name, God, and we know that there is nothing else that can fill the void. That you are the only one, the only thing that can meet us where we are. Oh, Lord God, let us be caught up in your presence.
just want you and nothing else nothing else nothing else will do i just want you nothing else nothing else nothing, nothing else, else will do i just want you nothing else Nothing else, nothing else will do, I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Stay here in the moment. Just feel his embrace. <laughs> How he has longed for this time with you. To hold you in his arms. To look you in the face. To let you know that he loves you. And that he has a plan. And he wants to empower you. He wants to walk through you. He wants to walk with you. He wants to lead you in the dance. To lead you in the song. To lead you into the fullness of his joy. Thank you, God, for loving us so much that you gave us your best. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. What a glorious day. I love when that sun comes out and the clouds are gone, but I love the, the fire of the Holy Spirit that burns within us. Amen. And uh, the blessing, and I still praise God for the blessing of uh, this field. And uh, wow, man, it's been five months we've been out here, a little over five months um, being out here. Thank you, Lord. And man, I don't know about you. I, I couldn't take it anymore with just the video. I had to assemble with the body of Christ. And what an amazing blessing it is to assemble with the body of Christ. And I rejoice in that, in that, in that truth of his love and of his presence. And uh, as we continue worshiping, please feel free to have a seat. Just, uh, again, we worship the Lord, in, in not just in our singing, but in everything that we do. And even now, as we uh, give the Lord our tithes and our offerings, you know, it makes a statement to him and how important, how valuable we, we see him, the value that he brings. And again, many people pursue Christ when they were in need. But I love that song because he'll meet one need and another need is going to pop up. But the biggest need that we have is a relationship with an almighty God. Because when you know that you're in a relationship with an almighty God, that change whatever circumstance you're going through. And part of walking through with this almighty God is knowing, hey, he's got me. And that I need to live by his word. And by his living word, not just his written word, I love his written word, but his living word. Because as you spend time in the, in the written word, it will come alive. And it will set you free and it will guide you in peace through Difficult situations, difficult circumstances, because you are not alone. You are part of something bigger than yourself. And what a blessing to come and assemble together to, to declare his love and his plan. So with that, as you come, we come, we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Afterwards, there will be uh, offering plates at, as you leave. Or you can give electronically at the HuntingtonChapel.com, and we'll find guide you through. But we just can just praise God for His rich blessing in the, even in these difficult times. So let us uh, in our hearts declare what we're going to be giving to our Lord, and uh, to give that in our hearts and just present it to Him right now. Oh dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the doors that you have opened, Lord, for breakthrough, for success, Lord, for our sustenance, for our life. And, Lord God, we acknowledge that it comes from you. 
Thank you, O Lord God, for the way that you strengthen our hands. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you encourage us to get out of bed. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you encourage us to, for action and prepare us for action. And dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come and we acknowledge that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And Lord, that without you, people just exist, Lord, but we want to live. And because we live, Lord, we want our, our tithes and our offerings to declare life. And Lord, that you would use them to bless, Lord, and advance your kingdom here and around the world. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, real quick, there's a, a, a couple of announcements just to, to be able to give. Um, on Monday night, uh, the women's Bible study, that is on, on Zoom on Monday. And then Higher Ground Ministries here at 7 o'clock. And then on Wednesday is our midweek service. On Thursday is our high school group here at 6. And um, we just, again, just praise God for the blessings of what he is doing in our, in our midst. Uh, I do want to encourage us as a church. We need to be praying. And I want to encourage us as, an, as his church to use the wisdom and also here in love because we have a country that has lost its way. We not only need to pray, I want to encourage you, if you are able, to join with me in fasting on this Monday and the next Monday after for our nation. That God will move and the Spirit of God would move within his church. That we would not make our vote based on personality, but we would make our vote based on, on, on policy. And that we would understand and to be able to, to share why we believe in the policies that we do. The sanctity of life. There's so many things and the, the need for God in our government. The need for God in every part of our life. And uh, so as we, I would encourage us, we all need to pray. We need to pray. We need to seek the Lord. We need to, to ask for him. Because here's the thing I love about our Constitution. You know, the, and, and, and it, the, the beauty of it, the splendor, and it's called a living document. And with that, they, the interpretation is, well, because the living document is living because we could change its definition to meet the needs of culture. But we also call the Bible a living document. But guess what? That's not the definition of a living document. The, we don't change the meaning of the Bible to meet the needs of the culture. The Bible is to guide us in the culture that we advance. And the same with the Constitution. It's not here to change. It's here to guide. And so we just need to continue to pr that in, in praying that God will, would lead us and bless us in these times. And we just praise his, his name. But I, I do encourage you, please join with me in praying and fasting this Monday and the following Monday. And if God puts it on your heart, on, on addition as well. And uh, that would be great. And what's that? Oh, yes. And there, there's one other thing that we do is the Operation Christmas Child. There's uh, boxes that we give. And this is for uh, Franklin Graham uh, organization that uh, we normally go and get a number of boxes and for presents. And they're sent around the world to different countries where uh, children don't have any opportunity to celebrate Christmas. And, uh, and they're not just giving them toys, but they come with a gospel message to let them know that they're fearfully and wonderfully made, that God loves them. And it has a great impact. So their boxes are out in the, in the front area. Uh, they need to be back here um, by November 15th. Okay, uh, so that's only just a couple weeks. So don't uh, dawdle on that. And uh, if, if God puts it in your heart, grab uh, one, two, three, four, whatever, how many boxes God has for you to do, and uh, do that and, uh, and bring it back here by November 15th. And uh, with that, I just want to ask Pastor Len Ballinger, if you could just come on up. Uh, I, I praise God. I praise God for his rich blessing. Pastor Len, man, I, I, I always remember the first time I met Pastor Len. And I, I've always looked up to Pastor Len. He is a, a powerful man of God, but he's also my brother. He's also a spiritual mentor to me. And, and I love doing life with him.
<laughs> and, uh, and I'm so honored. He was, as he's here in the area, he just called me up. Hey, hey Doug, I, I'm in the area. Uh, I'm, I, got a, I got a free morning Sunday. And I'm like, hallelujah, come on down. And uh, so I, I'm excited for what the Lord wants to come and to bring. And uh, I, I pray right now. And again, everyone, if you would just all please stand. Let me ask you, do you have faith that God wants to reveal something to you today? See, you need to have faith. Are you hungry for a breakthrough in your life? Are you hungry for more of God or to, to really to, to enjoy life instead of just get through? Do you have the faith that Jesus wants to meet with you right here, right now? I pray that you would ask him to reveal himself, to speak through Pastor Lynn, and just speak to him. Let's all speak out, pray out loud right now, and then I'll close. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that the kingdom of heaven is built upon relationship. And we thank you, Lord, that we are the body of Christ and we assemble in spirit, in truth, and in love because you are great and greatly to be praised. And dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come. I thank you, Lord, for the message that you have put on Pastor Len's heart. I <laughs> thank you, Lord, for his love for his devotion, for, Lord, for just to be the, the privilege of doing life with him and, and, and Lord, just talking and, and, Lord, hearing from you through each other. Lord, bless him this day. But, Lord, I pray that your word would use him well. And, Lord, that your spirit would burn in our hearts. And, Lord, that you go before him. And, dear Lord, Father, in faith, Lord, we are ready to receive the impartation of, of wisdom, of power, of, of action, Lord, that you have uh, given through him to us. And we receive that now in Jesus' name. Bless him and lead him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God. Can I grab uh, what was it? Was this right here? Just be seated. Please be seated. Thank you, guys. Um, I wonder, is, do I need to be from the speakers out here. Wow, it's good to be here. My uh, Florida blood's a little bit thin for outdoor services. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I'm well insulated, as you can see. So, uh, so that's good. That is good. So, wow, it's great to be here with you guys and, and to see you. Uh, I've actually been uh, in the area here, actually north from here, with my wife in Massachusetts and then Maine, uh, eating lobster up in in Maine. And, and uh, today, uh, my wife actually is not with me because we actually had a family event. I may or may not have come here to escape the family event. But uh, I love to be here with you, and uh, and it's great to be up here in uh in the area and i believe that god has given me a word for you today and uh my wife would be with me but again she's she is uh committed elsewhere and i will join her later this afternoon so i want to to bring a word to you today i believe that uh that god spoke to me let me get my uh my ducks in a row and uh, I have rolling water because the water's kind of rolling down the uh, down the thing here. So let me see. There we go. I just have to get my technology working in the right way. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that God has called us as his people and as his church 
to be an influential voice in this region. We have had a year like no other that I can imagine. And uh, in my city, we, uh, as, as all of us in coastal living get once in a while, uh, endured a, a hurricane. Uh, and the one that hit us down in North Florida was called Sally. And we weren't that worried about Sally because Sally was, uh, was just um, like a category. They weren't even sure it was going to be a category one, maybe a two. And so we just kind of buckled down. But Sally moved over and stopped. And how many know even if you're not getting punched very hard, but you get punched repeatedly long enough? It still does some damage. And let me tell you what the enemy does to his people. He likes to move over his people, over, over the people of God, and he just likes to, to just stay there and just stay on us and punch us until we're weary. But let me tell you, we have to draw strength from God so that we can be who he's called us to be in the day and the time that we're living in. And we live in actually very unique and powerful times in the earth. And I don't want you to get concerned because, let me tell you, God, the last I read, is still on the throne. He's, he's ruling. He's not reacting. He's God. And we have the incredible privilege to live in some days that I believe may be the greatest days the earth has ever seen. Even in the midst of them being fearful days. But God has called us to be an influential voice. Jesus called the church to go into all the world. Not just the world that you like or the world that looks like you or the world that's convenient. He said go into all the world. Amen. And we've been trying for years to get the world to come to the church. But since we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, God intends that we go to the world. Why are we called to go to the world? Because anything you don't touch, you can't change. You have to reach it and touch it. So today I want to give you some systematic prophetic revelation about something called expectation that I believe God told me to release to you today. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, and I want to take you to a, a relatively familiar story. Uh, whether you're familiar or not, I'm going to read the whole story, but I want to call your attention to one key verse. In Acts chapter 3, and we're going to begin at the first verse, it says this, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer the ninth hour, and a certain man who was lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid at the gate of the temple, they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said these words, silver and gold, I do not have. But what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. I know we prayed, but close your eyes one more time. Holy Spirit. Let your word come alive to us today. Let it come alive in us, God, that it would work through us, that we would walk according to your purposes in the name of Jesus. Amen. What really captures me in this story is verse 5, where it says, He gave them his attention, expecting 
to receive something from them. I want everybody to shout the word expecting. My assignment today is to bring a message to you I'm going to call Raise Your Expectation. Here in Acts, we see this amazing story of a disabled man who encounters John and Peter at a temple gate expecting to receive something. You know what I've discovered? you generally get what you expect. I have. Well, Pastor Lynn, I just don't trust them. I'm not going to open up my heart to anybody. You generally get what you expect. Well, this is never going to change. You generally get what you expect. Well, I can't afford to do that. I'm too old for that. People always misunderstand me. You generally get what you expect. Well, that's never going to happen. God doesn't answer my prayer. You generally get what you expect. What faith is actually designed to do is to raise your expectation. And I want you to know today that it takes courage to expect. Most people won't expect because they're too afraid of disappointment. They would rather live down here and be settled than live up here and possibly be disappointed. So they stay on the ground with a cup begging for change when they could be moving into the purposes of God of their life. We're so afraid of disappointment. We're so afraid. We want to stay where everything is safe and normal and predictable and acceptable and routine rather than to break the pattern. But I came today to shake you up a little bit because it's time to break the pattern. Come on, look at somebody next to you. I know we got to be social distant, but look at somebody next to you and say, it's time to break the pattern. Come on, I don't know if it's for everybody, but this is for somebody because I feel the glory of God about to break over you. One of the things that good security guards are assigned to do when protecting targeted people is to have them occasionally change the way they go somewhere or the way they do something because they have to break the pattern. If you do everything the same way every day, it's easier for somebody to take you out. A lot of us would be easy targets if somebody were out to get us because we go to the same stores, the same gas station, go to work the same way, go home the same way. And most people are predictable because they don't change. That's what makes them an easy target. Come on, I hear the Lord telling me today in some of your lives, he wants to change the pattern. Satan has been seeking whom he may devour, but God is going to change the pattern and you're not going to be the same after this year. So what we have in this scripture today is a guy that's making the best out of a bad situation. He has been lame from birth. It's all he's ever known. When all you've seen is brokenness, It's hard to develop an appetite for wholeness because you don't have a reference for what wholeness is really like. If all you've ever seen is difficulty, if all you've ever seen is dysfunction, if all you've ever seen is poverty, it's hard to see outside of that because that's your norm. Even though you get frustrated by it, you you end up living in what your normal is and and you become uh, sometimes threatened by anything outside of your normal, even if it's what God has for you. He was lame from his mother's womb. When you've been lame all your life, poor all your life, intimidated all your life, angry all your life, you develop a norm around a broken identity. And my question for somebody today is this, has your broken become your normal? This man has been lame all of his life. So he's built, and listen to this word, routine. Everybody say routine. He's built routine around his disability. Routine is when you build around what you believe can't be changed. 
You can be a great church for 50 years, but if you don't challenge yourself, a church can get into a routine where it never gets to the place God is trying to take it. The Bible says daily they laid him at this temple gate called beautiful. So he wakes up in the morning. He has no expectation to walk. Every day he waits for somebody to take him to the gate. When you do the same thing every day, Sometimes you forget what day it is because every day looks the same. Is this Tuesday? What day is this? Every day they take him to the gate beautiful. Every day he ends up in the same place. Have you ever lived a life where every day you end up in the same place? You wear different clothes. You were with different people. Maybe you work different jobs, but you end up in the same place day after day. Blue, they drop him in the same place. Is this Thursday? What day is it? Every day looks the same. And when every day looks the same, it's easy to lose expectation for something new. When every day looks the same, you no longer appreciate morning. What difference does morning make when it's going to look just the same as it did yesterday? Why should I prepare for routine. I'm already trained. I already know how to do this. I'm not challenged. He was in routine. They put him in front of the temple gate called beautiful. And by the way, this gate was beautiful. It was about 60 feet wide, made of brass. Actually, some people say it was actually overlaid with gold. It was opulent and it was designed to stand out. That's why they called the gate beautiful. So here we have an ugly situation at a beautiful place. Have you ever had an ugly problem in a beautiful place? How can I be at a beautiful place and still have a problem? How can everything look so beautiful on the outside, but I carry an ugly secret on the inside? Look at the contrast right here in this story. He's laid at this gate called beautiful, but he has a problem that keeps him from getting through the gate. Listen, anytime you see gates in the Bible, gates represent transition. A lot of times people think they're at a wall or a barrier, but really it's a gate. And if you understand that God's trying to take you somewhere, you see things differently. All of the children of Israel, all of the people of Israel, when Goliath threatened them, they saw Goliath as a wall. But David saw Goliath as a gate. He said, if I'll conquer Goliath, I can get some. Nobody saw Goliath as a gate except one person. And when the one person went through the gate, he steps into his destiny. Anytime you see gates mentioned in the Bible, it always represents transition. So here we have a gate. Every day they lay him close to something that he could not get into. Is there anyone here who's tired of almost? I almost did this. I almost made it. I almost got the job. I almost fell in love. I almost got free. I'm tired of almost. Everybody else was going in the gate. But he was just getting near the gate. He was just almost getting in. When you're stuck in a routine, constantly watching other people access places that you can't reach, if you're not careful, you begin to think, maybe it's not for me. Maybe this isn't supposed to be. Anytime you get frustrated enough in a routine you can't escape, you start making excuses. And listen to this, excuses comfort incapacity. I'm going to say that again. Excuses, comfort, incapacity. Well, I would have if, I, I could have if, I should have if. Excuses, comfort, incapacity. It's not my fault. They didn't help me. They didn't love me. They didn't. This didn't. That didn't. What's amazing about this story is that this man is laying in front of a temple gate, and this man is physically what the temple is spiritually. They're both lame. 
At this point in the New Testament, Jesus has already ascended back to heaven. The walls and the veils that were destroyed when the cro- at the cross, when the earthquake came and the veil was torn, all of those have now been repaired. And they're trying to get back to business as usual. And they're trying to convince themselves that they did not miss the Messiah. They've made excuses. They believe lies. They're trying to convince themselves that Jesus is a nobody. So the temple is lame spiritually like the man outside the temple is lame physically. It's a powerful paradox. If you want to go a little deeper, you're really looking at two temples. The man is a temple and the temple is a temple and they're both lame in different ways. The temple is lame because they've rejected Jesus and they've got into religious routine. The man is lame because his feet and ankles don't work. So spiritually speaking, here's what I want you to get. Lameness always stays close to lameness. Because it's comforting to be around other people who experience the same brokenness as you. Have you ever noticed that unhappily married people don't like to hang out with happily married people? Have you ever noticed that? Why? Because dysfunction loves community. We say it this way, misery loves company, right? In fact, miserable people like to hang out with miserable people because happy people get on their nerves. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. What in the mm, are you smiling about? Every time you come to work, you're happy. Listen, when happy gets on your nerves, it's because something in you is not whole. Come on, somebody, I'll amen myself on that. People who walk in their blessings are never jealous of other people who walk in their blessings. So if you show me who your friends are, I'll know a whole lot about you. Because a lot of times we're similar to who we hang around. Whatever is laying beside you at the gate is related to you in some way. So the Lord wants you to know that you're at a gate today. It's a word of the Lord for you. The gate is access. The gate is opportunity. The gate is something new. The Lord wants you to know that your life is not called to be routine and ritualistic. But you end up living the life you expect. If you want more, expect more. There's abundance for you that you have never seen. And the secret is hidden in your expectation. But when you make a routine out of being miserable, a routine out of complaining, a routine out of living life every day the same purposeless way, you become so used to being dysfunctional, angry, and frustrated that you end up missing the access that God's trying to get you to. So is being happy unusual for you? Then maybe Check. Maybe I turned it off. I got so excited, I turned off the microphone. The light's red. I don't know if that's... I'll move back again. I'll social distance. I'll I'll come back where I'm supposed to be anyway. Change. We can't get stuck in routine, right? Come on. You've got to get through your gate. Come on. If you can't walk through, roll through, crawl through. If you can't crawl through, push through, but go through your gate. There's something in front of you, and God spoke to me to say this to you, Huntington Chapel. There's something in front of you God's taking you through. 
and your faith will never have anything to do until you break your routine because your expectation can't grow until you break your routine. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you don't hope for anything, if you don't expect anything, you're not going to see anything happen because faith has nothing to be substance for. People get frustrated and upset. Well, I don't know if I'm going to go to church or not. Why? Because you don't have a dream to feed. I can teach you how to cook, but I can't teach you how to be hungry. Listen, I, I, know, a lot of, I know a lot about food. I have like a PhD in buffets. I'm good. I'm gifted in that area. I can tell you a lot about food and recipes, and, and you can take cooking classes. But how many know there's no such thing as hunger classes? There's not, because you can't teach people how to be hungry. Listen, your next blessing is predicated by your next level of hunger. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, he that hungers and thirsts will be filled. So if all you want is to be laid daily at the gate, then that's what you're going to get every day. But here's the question, do you have the courage to expect something greater. If you don't, you'll end up thinking, I'm never going to get out of prison, so I might as well just decorate my jail cell. Since I'll never have an abundant life, just lay me here close to it. At least I can watch other people go in. And maybe somebody else with abundant life will put their abundance in my cup while they walk by. So they lay him daily at a gate called Beautiful. Look at this. Religion had walked by this man every single day. Religion has gone in and out the door. Religion has its own routine, right? It's easy in religious circles to get in our routines. Well, we don't read the scripture before you pray. You must always pray before you read the scripture. Don't sit there. That's Miss Jones' seat. Miss Jones always sits there. Says, don't come in here dressed like that. We dress like this here. Religion always gets into its own routine. So religion is walking past this man all the time, and religion is throwing coins in his cup because religion can't raise him up. Religion will always throw coins in your cup, but it can't raise you up. Religion always comforts you in your crisis. Well, I just felt so encouraged by that message. I felt so encouraged by that song she sang. It didn't change anything, but it made me feel better. ka -ching. Coins in the cup. Coins in the cup. Religion will always throw coins in the cup of routine. It doesn't matter what kind of church you go to, it can still become routine if you're not careful. Let me tell you something about church. It's not just about going, it's about expecting. It's not just about attending, it's about passing into something. That's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. You can attend until you wear the seats out, but if you don't expect, you will never get what God is calling you to. I go to churches all over the world. I see people stuck in routine, doing nothing, reaching nobody, having no effect, because there is no expectation connected to the purposes of God. They're just lame at the gate, holding out the cup for some more change. And God is calling us to have change, not collect change. He's calling us to walk into something that we've never been in before. You can be in the presence of God and still never get free. You can be in the presence of God and never get healed. You can be in the presence of God and never get answered because you didn't expect. I, I, we live on... We live on the coast in Florida, and, and there's a lot. You can go out to marinas, and you see a lot of sailboats. And on a windy day, you'll see some of those sailboats moving through the water, and other sailboats will be sitting in the marina. What's the difference? The same wind is blowing across all the boats. The difference is some of the boats have their sails up, and some don't. 
The same wind can blow, but if you don't have something up to catch the wind called expectation, you'll never get where God is trying to take you. It's so important. I'm tired of the routine of religion. I'm tired of coins clinking around in my cup. I don't need clever messages and warm feelings. I need a transformation from a powerful God that I believe in. Routine has been, amen, routine has been fraternized by religion. Religion has been going in and throwing coins in the cup of routine. And routine and religion have been going in these cycles for years until all of a sudden, here comes Peter and John. Here comes expectation. Expectation approaches the routine. And listen, expectation will wear religion out. Expectation will get on religious nerves. Expectation will shake people up. Expectation will make people upset. But expectation will change the man laying from the gate in front of the gate to a man walking through the gate. I prophesy divine expectation coming over your life. I prophesy that God is coming to bring new levels of expectation to you, that he is stirring up your faith again, that you can be who he's called you to be in this time. You see, Everywhere Jesus went, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. They learned to live in expectation through their relationship. When you have an expectation, you learn to anticipate on a higher level. Most people in church don't do much more than show up on Sunday. Half of them haven't even been living a Christian life all week until Sunday. You don't have an expectation with God. If that's you, you have religion with the church. And until church gets into your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're just religious. But when you get activation in your expectation, you can transform everything around you. I'm sorry, I'm a little excited. I have to preach louder because it's cold outside. But God is going to do something through this message expectation came up to routine it stands in the face of religion and says look on us quit looking over here quit looking up here look on us the reason you're not getting anywhere is because you've been laying at the gate of religion and you feel dead on the inside but god's getting ready to bring resurrection power to your life so expectation approaches, and when it approaches, it always comes to break routine. Anytime you get exposed to expectation, people around you should notice something different. Something's happened to you. You have a different look on your face. You have a different passion about you. That's why some people around you may not like you as much as they used to, because as long as you stayed in the routine, you were okay. But now you've gone rogue. Now you've gone out on your own. Come on, find somebody around you that expects something to happen and hang around them. Get around people that are expecting. Get around people that have faith. Get around people that are a little bit dangerous. Get around people that want to be on the edge. So routine sits at the door of religion and looks up in the face of expectation. Expecting to receive something what are you going to put in my cup come on this is not just a story today it's a principle and it's a principle of power so look at this this lame man is in routine he's laid daily at the gate beautiful the temple is religion they only drop coins in his cup peter and john come with expectation and they say look on us and expectation says this silver and gold i do not have now look at this they're standing in front of a gold door 60 feet of gold but they say silver and gold we don't have What's behind them is very flashy. It looks good. It's the thing people are used to seeing, but they come up because expectation isn't that flashy. It's, it's not that impressive, but expectation knows who it is. 
Expectation has courage. Expectation has confidence. I don't have silver. I don't have gold, but I do have something. And what I have, I'm going to give to you. I know you're used to people dropping a coin in your cup, but I have something better and bigger than can fit in your cup. So Peter looks at this man and says, silver and gold, I don't have any. What he's saying is something is getting ready to happen that's going to go beyond your current level of expectation. What we're going to give you is actually above what you're expecting. And here's what I believe God is saying to you as his church today. God is getting ready to give you something that is higher than the level you've been expecting. God's getting to raise your expectations. He's going to raise you up into his level of what he's taking you into in this next year. You've been functioning at this level. You've been receiving on this level. But God says, I'm not going to meet you at your expectation. I'm going to raise you up to my expectation so you can get somewhere you've never been before. Amen. Man, this message is so good. I want to get a copy and listen to it myself. Some people teach, listen, some people teach that Peter and John didn't have any money. They teach, well, Peter and John were broke. But listen, Peter and John weren't broke, and this has nothing to do with money that they had. Peter and John may very well have had some coins in their pocket, but their coins were not for the lame man. Their silver and gold were not for him. This was about dimensions. They were saying, you've been operating in one dimension of expectation, but we're getting ready to take you to another dimension. And the problem with most people is they expect on a dimension that is too low. I didn't come to give you silver. I didn't come to give you gold because it's not about silver and gold because silver and gold will not fix your problem. I have a word for you today. God will not give to you what will not work for you. Some of you are praying for things and you're wondering, God, why are you not responding? God will not give to you what will not work for you. God's going to give you something that's going to raise you up and get you through the gate he's called you to go through. Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Look at this. You can't miss this. Here's what they didn't do. Let me get, I need a, can I get a lame man to illustrate with? Come up here. Come up here. I need you. Just bring one of those, bring one of those chairs up here. And just... Yeah. <laughs> Just sit right there. Not gonna hit with chair, right? No, maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. Sit right there. So here we have. So here we have the lame man sitting at the gate with the cup, begging for money to make it another day. And, and I want you to look at this. When Peter and John come up to him, here's what they don't do. They don't pray for him. Have you ever noticed that in the story? They did not pray for him. They didn't kneel down and ask God. They didn't pray for him at all. They didn't say, Father, if it be your will. Lord, there is no one, no other help I know. They didn't, they didn't do any of that. They didn't pray for him at all. They did not even talk to God about him. They didn't ask God to do anything. They spoke to his condition. And this is something really interesting to me and powerful. They said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Now let me tell you why they didn't pray. And there's nothing wrong with prayer. Prayer is a good thing. But when you just pray over it and it doesn't work... You can blame God for it. Well, I guess the Lord didn't hear my prayer. It must not have been the Lord's will. Maybe it's not the right time. Maybe I didn't have enough faith. But Peter and John didn't pray for the man. They commanded his condition. They spoke to his circumstance and said, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Romans 
chapter 12 says that we can speak those things that are not as though they are. And sometimes I think we pray about things, and there's nothing wrong with praying about things, but we need to speak to things. There's a certain amount of courage and strength that comes when you just speak to something. And this is absolutely powerful. You know why people don't do that a lot today? Because what if it doesn't work? The devil always has a suppose for you. Well, suppose it doesn't work. Suppose I do it and this doesn't happen. Suppose we step out and it doesn't go like we feel like it's going to go. I'm not going to tell anybody I'm going to do better because suppose it doesn't work. I'm not going to be a light in the world because suppose it doesn't work. I'm not going to pray for healing because suppose it doesn't work. So what I do is I never really sell out to anything because I don't want to be disappointed and I don't want to disappoint anybody else. And so I always leave space for me to stay lame. And then I wonder, God, why don't you do anything? I'm not going to command anything because suppose it doesn't work. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Wait, we're not there yet. Here's why, listen, I would love to tell you that when they said it, that lame man leaped up, but that's not what happened. I want you to look. Look at this. When they spoke the word initially, nothing immediately happened. When you speak something and you don't see an immediate result, a lot of times that's when you want to give up. When you speak something and, and, and doubt wants to come in at that point, and, and steal what God has. Sometimes you have to keep standing and you have to keep pushing for what you know God said to do and what you know God can do in you. So when they spoke and their word didn't have an immediate effect, here's what they didn't do. They didn't just walk away and say, we'll keep believing, we'll keep praying for you. The Bible says this, faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith without corresponding action is dead. Faith without works isn't going to do anything. It's not going to do anything. Hmm. Here's what it says they did. Peter reached down and took him by the hand and pulled him up. And that's when he got up, when he pulled him up. Here, sit back down for a second. Because here's the thing. In fact, if you're close enough to grab somebody's hand, it's probably a little chilly anyway. Grab somebody's hand and pull on it a little bit and say, it's time to get up. Come on, I'm raising expectation here today. I'm not going to let you just lay there. Somewhere in the act... After Peter spoke in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk, somewhere in the act of grabbing his hand and pulling on him, strength came in him. It was in the action of what they did that caused him to be healed. And it's powerful. And now what's in here is irrelevant because what God did in here made all the difference. You can go sit down. I'll put this back here. <laughs> Here's the powerful thing and that I want you to get today, and I'm about to close, but listen, the miracle happens in the process. What was the process? Peter's expectation raised the expectation of the man. They put works with the faith. People, some people are just sitting and waiting for the miracle. But if you'll start pulling on somebody else in agreement, if you'll start pulling on some stuff, you're going to see God begin to move. You have to have people around you who will challenge you. You have to have people around you who will say, get out of the routine. If not, you'll always stay in the same condition that you're in. 
This is the power of relationship. It's the power of the church. It's why we have to understand the times that we're in and not respond like everybody else around us, but respond like the word of God. Dear God, we have a whole generation that wants to see something with an answer, and they're all spinning around in circles doing the same thing, hearing each other talk, and nothing changes because we need somebody with expectation who will say, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. It's a new day. We live in the most opportune time to preach the gospel in any generation that we have, we've seen in this nation. We live in one of the most opportune time to see God do something that he's never done before. Or we can just sit in routine. The Bible says when Peter pulled on his hand, immediately, immediately, God's immediately was in contrast to the man's lame all his life. God's immediately was in contrast to his impossibility. And so what happens is his recovery did not look like his history. What God is getting ready to do is not going to look like what has been before. God's getting ready to do something new. Watch this. He's expecting something that he's never experienced before. It's one thing to experience something, lose it, and experience it again. But this man has never actually walked one day in his life. It's not like he walked and had an accident and then God restored his walking. He has never walked before. Medically speaking, he's never learned to walk. And anybody who has never walked and becomes able to walk still has to go through therapy. They still have to learn. He would have had to go through a process to recover and actually learn to walk. But the Bible says immediately he leaped up. Immediately he started walking. And the Lord says, I believe today God is saying you're getting ready to walk where you've never walked before into a dimension you've never been in before. You're not going to stay where you were. You're not going to keep your routine. You're going to walk and leap in a place that you've never experienced. It's not going to look like your history. Huntington Chapel, you're here for a reason. You're not just here because. You're not just here for a routine. You're not just here to drop coins in a cup. You're here to make a difference, to see something change, to be in effect. And don't be surprised that God may not put his finger in this place, in this time, for a unique purpose. And seasons that you thought were past haven't even started yet. God's getting ready to do something. Here's the last thing the man did, and it's the most important thing. The Bible says he started praising God. Come on. Sometimes we have to just lift our voice and begin to praise God. You have to walk. You have to jump. You have to praise God. Look, the lame man walks through the gate for the first time. When he did, if you read on in the story, you find out the people inside the temple did not recognize the man. They said, who is this? Who is this man disrupting our service, messing up our routine? Where is God taking you? People who saw you in one dimension are not going to recognize you in the next dimension. Huntington Chapel, people who saw you in a previous dimension are not going to recognize you in the dimension God is raising you into. This is the word I have for you. But your expectation is what will change your reality. You can't go back to the place where your ankles and feet were lame. You have to go forward into a place that you've never seen before, expecting God to do something he's never done before for you, for your families, for your children. Otherwise, we lose a generation. We have a whole young generation that are not content with tell me, they won't show me. Don't tell me about a powerful God, show me a powerful God. Otherwise, they get lost. Do you hear this is vital, generationally speaking? 
not just for our nation, but for this next generation in this nation. It's so important. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to us today. And God is getting ready to pull somebody up. Things that have been happening in this season. Things that we're seeing. Even, uh, I don't even have time to preach the prophetic situation that happened with, with Ruth Bader Ginsburg's death and when she died. And how significant that is to justice in the United States and what God spoke through that. Listen, a lot of times we miss things that God is doing and God is working around us. It is a time and a day. That's why I'm preaching like I'm preaching to you today. That's why I want, to, I want you to get a hold of something today because I believe this is for you specifically. I believe it's for you specifically. It's so important. I want to speak to that that secret part of your life that's pulling you down. I want to speak to that thing that makes you need people in a way that you shouldn't need people because you really need to be drawing that from God. I want to speak to you in a way that carries you to a place that you never imagined you would be carried to. So right now I want you to to just stand up to your feet, put everything down. And I know it's chilly outside and I'm done, but I want you to do something today. I want you right where you're standing, right at your chairs, I want you to kind of just, to just kind of start taking some steps right where you are, just kind of step in place. And, and as you're doing that, I believe God is saying, I'm, you're walking into something new. You stood up and you're walking into something that you've never walked in before. Come on, some of you need to like jump up a little bit, like the guy jumped up a little bit. Come on, God is taking you somewhere. You're jumping into something. Now I want you to lift both of your hands and right where you're at with no music, nothing else, I just want you to start praising the Lord right now for things that you haven't seen yet, for places he's going to take you, for things he's doing in your family, for things he's doing in this community, things he's doing in this nation. Jesus, we praise you, God, for what we haven't seen yet. We thank you, God, that you're raising our expectation to believe for something we've not believed for yet. So right now, right where you're at, I want you to just stop for just a moment and whatever it is that you're believing God for in the next year that you want to see God do in the next year. And if you're like not sure about that, then I want you to take some time and I want you to get some understanding from the Lord what you need to be expecting the next year for you, your family, for this, this church, this community, this region. God is getting ready to do something powerful. So Holy Spirit, I thank you right now. Come on, while you're looking at that, I want you to become the prophet to your own life right now. I want you to speak those things that are not as though they are over your own life. Romans chapter 12 says you can do that. You can take those things and begin to speak them from your mouth from your expectation, according to the will of God, you can speak to them just like Peter and John spoke to the lame man in front of the gate. Lord, we speak into this coming year. Lord, I speak that we're going to see a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. I speak for the power of God to be revealed. I speak for new things to happen in our worship. I speak for kids that have been wandering away from God to come back to the Lord. I speak for houses to raise up. I speak for struggling, difficult situations to be shifted. I speak for divisions of relationships and marriages to come back into restoration. I speak for these things to happen right now, that we could be the light and salt in the earth in this generation. That's my prayer today, Lord. I speak it over this house. I speak it over on this outdoor chilly day. God, I thank you, Jesus, that we are expecting something and you're stirring us up on the inside. I pray right now for this to happen. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Do you believe it today? Come on, give God an offering of your praise today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
I want you to get a hold of this message today, and I want you to take it with you. I believe like a seed in good soil, it's going to bear some powerful fruit today. Amen. 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 I love you guys so much. God bless you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Len. What a blessing. Yeah. Hallelujah. And guys, it is, it is a great blessing that we have. The next, if the worship team would come on up, we're going to just have a, a closing song. I want you to know I believe God is changing his expectations. See, there it says in, in Psalm 46, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Now, that's talking about you and me. We're that river that we make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. He will lift her up at break of day. I praise the Lord. in order for us to be a river we got to come together <laughs> we got to come together and we flow together into the heart of God and he never leaves us empty he will always fill you up so let's just flow let's have our expectation raised to the heavens It came and refreshed me. It came and 
wash my sins away. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this truth that you are that fountain and you are full of grace. Oh, Lord God, how you came and you healed us. You came and refreshed us and you took our sins away. Lord God, we give them to you. And Lord, we thank you that you not only have taken our sins, but you have given us life. Oh, Lord God, may we stop existing. May we start truly living. Living for you. Living, oh Lord, with an expectation. Lord, that with you, we can do all things. We can do all things through Christ. And dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we rejoice, Lord. Lord, because regardless of our circumstances, we will choose to rejoice and be glad because you're with us. We praise your holy name. Rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad. Hallelujah. I just... I'm going to have everybody to sit down for one second because if you're as old as me, you remember a guy named Paul Harvey that gave the rest of the story. <laughs> and there's a rest of the story today because I'm not just here because I was in the area and I was. That's not the only reason I'm here, but it just so happened to work out. I got a call from uh, Mr. Al a few weeks ago, and I invited myself to speak <laughs> and uh, with Doug, but because today is a really special day, and uh, because Doug is celebrating 20 years as a pastor, 20 years in ministry today, and so this is actually a part of something even bigger <laughs> to celebrate you and to honor you today in this with your people and uh, Liz why don't you come up here too and and I believe that God is doing something I have walked with this man right here through some really highs and some really lows in some big places and some difficult places even though we're distant and sometimes we've gone long periods of time without without talking and and uh, just because of distance and busyness, but I've seen God do amazing things. I've seen God do incredible things, Doug, through you. And I believe as I preach this message that the best is yet to come. Amen. The Amen. best is yet to come. Hallelujah. And I want to personally honor you. I had the chance to actually uh, ordain you actually really truly God ordains us men don't I got a chance to recognize ordination <laughs> on your life and uh, and to really be um, a huge part of what God has done with you what God has done here at Huntington Chapel and what he's going to do in the days ahead and I just want to pray over you and Liz right now Lord I thank you God Lord, for Doug and Liz, God, and we pray honor of them. And I know others have some words they're going to share right now. But, Lord, I thank you right now, Lord, that the things that, have, that they've walked through, Lord Jesus, are only the beginning. And, Lord God, that great things are ahead. 
And I hear the Lord saying, my son, I'm getting ready to open heaven over you and I'm going to open your eyes to see into the fourth dimension, the dimension of my glory, says God, in these days that are coming. And I'm going to give divine wisdom to you and strength, says the Lord, for the things that you've walked through are past and there's new things ahead. And I pray over you right now, and I pray over Liz, both of you right now, that there's things that you have, have, have kind of walked through and things that can easily jade a person's heart, and you've been willing to keep going. And the Lord says, I have a crown, says the Lord, for that, because you didn't allow yourself to get hardened. And the Lord says, when I close a door, no man can open it. And when I open a door, no man can close it. And just like I said in my word, I set before you an open door today, and the doors that have been passed are closed, and they're not going to be reopened. There are altars you will not have to revisit and places you will not have to go again. But there are new places ahead, says the Lord. New challenges, but new places of glory. New, new battles and new victories that are ahead. And Lord, I thank you, God, for Doug. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for Liz. God, I thank you, Lord God, for their lives. And Lord, for their hearts, God. And Liz, I just see the hand of God coming on you and stirring up things from even taking you back like, like, like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. In, in places where there was such sensitivity in the things of the spirit. And I see God just blessing you. I see the Lord like, like there's a picture of like, uh, like oil that in the spirit that's over you, Liz. And I see God just pouring it into you. And that oil is there for refreshing and, and renewing you on the inside. And I just see God strengthening you in this next season to see things that you've never seen before and to expect things you've never expected before. And I see the two of you, your family, your boys, your house, and this house of God. And I see God coming upon Huntington Chapel. And I see God bringing you to a new season of supernatural moments. Some are so small that you won't even recognize at first that they're supernatural till after. And some will be so outstanding that it'll make you stand back and go, wow, what just happened? And I see God doing it in this place. And his hand has been on this place. And the enemy's tried to come against it from the right and the left. He's tried to shut it down. He's tried to pull it down. But the Lord says, I have prevailed in this house. And I will continue, says God, to do great things in the days ahead says the Lord. So, Lord, I thank you for that. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for my dear brother. I love him so much, God, and I thank you, God, for the privilege I have to stand here with him on this day <laughs> and honor him in person. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <laughs> How's everyone doing? I just uh, want to say a couple nice words about my father. Um, <laughs> you all know what an amazing man he is, right? It's uh, it really is a blessing to be in his life and also be his son. It's uh, <laughs> it's really cool. It, my father is my business partner, my pastor, my landlord, and all those things. And I still really love the guy. <laughs> and on top of that, he's one of my best friends, and so that really says a lot about a man's character. <laughs> Doug, we've known each other for many, many years, and um, I'm proud to be in your church, part of your church, and part of the church of, of Jesus Christ. And the importance of this place, because I don't follow any man. I wasn't built that way. And I follow Pastor Doug, because he listens to the Lord. He reads his word, and he follows his spirit. This is why I'm here at Huntington Chapel, and thank you, Doug, for being my pastor. You stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> nana, nana, boo, boo. <laughs> Amen.
<laughs> well deserved, well deserved honor. <laughs> when I first came to the chapel, um, the pastor was on sabbatical. But I just kept hearing, wait till the pastor comes back. Wait till you meet the pastor. Wait till you meet the pastor. And, and I finally met him. And he said to me, you know, I want to get to know you a little better. So after about, I don't know, four or five weeks, we finally got together on a Monday. And we've been meeting ever since. And uh, the, what I've learned, his example, his example, like Steve said, he reads, his, he reads the word book, the example. I'm not only afraid of Jesus, I'm afraid of him. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I got to tell the pastor. If I do that, I got to tell the pastor. I'm like, oh, I got to tell him. But I'm never going to lie to him. I, I'm never going to lie to the guy because he's going to know anyway. But, uh, he's my spiritual father, my brother, my friend. And like Steve said, he's my pastor too. So I love you, pastor. Thank you so much. I'm not on the list of people who are supposed to say something, but I, but I thought I could say something. Um, so I, I just I just want to say um, that uh, I I know a lot of people, right? I've been around this world a long time. I know a lot of people professionally and socially, and and I can honestly say I've never never met someone who. Um, is so so genuine in their love for others you know in the way that he cares about you all and then some it's just you know I've never seen such a such a uh, someone who was designed to be a shepherd right because that's what a pastor is and you know you know those of us who know him well you know he you know he's not so great at you know filling out that piece of paper or you know <laughs> doing this particular you know thing that we would like you to do right then at that time but you know he he just he just loves people he loves you and he's so and he's genuine he's just so real you know he's sometimes he's more real than i think i'd like him to be but definitely you know this is it's beautiful to see god's calling on your life and uh and and thank you i'm honored to not just call you my best friend and, and my husband, but also my pastor. Some of us were uh, wondering if uh, Pastor Doug was bad because he came in with this uh, thing on his foot, Liz. Uh, <laughs> hey, Pastor. Hey. Good to see you. I got, uh, we're going to make a little presentation. Um like to talk a little bit about uh, the epistle to the Ephesians, also called the letter to Ephesians and often shortened as Ephesians. Its authorship has traditionally been attributed to Paul the Apostle and according tradition was believed to be written while Paul was in prison. Uh, but there has also been some research that challenges that, believing that 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 it was not written directly by Paul, but one of his uh, close believers uh, replicating the message. So Ephesians 6.11 says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. It describes the various pieces of armor and their representative powers such as the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, footwear of readiness, and then in Ephesians 6.16 it talks about the fourth piece of armor, the shield of faith. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one followed by the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. What does it mean to have faith, and how can this be related to a shield? How can this possibly be related to Pastor Doug? I myself have spent many years pondering this question. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Even though we cannot physically see God, he has manifested himself through creation. Therefore, our faith in him 
is based on this truth. I was set on this path of understanding this truth exactly what I needed at the time by Pastor Doug. To celebrate our pastor, my friend, our friend, and faithful guide, we, members of the Huntington Chapel, family, friends, locally, and from the south, who didn't bring warm weather with him, <laughs> Pastor Len, <laughs> and many locations in between and abroad wish to celebrate you for the 20 years of pastorship with our presence here today, loving wishes, and this shield with your own personalized coat of arms. Pastor, you freely gave me one of the most important yet simple lessons of my life with these words. Al, you're not expected to have blind faith. You're not expected to have blind faith. Pastor then, along with several of my brothers and sister, yes, you, Carolyn, on a long drive down to the Jubilee about three years ago, methodically destroyed all my doubt. <laughs> one by one, with the dozens and dozens of questions that I was going to pierce holes in this strong belief. And by the way, that year when we went down to the conference together, Pastor Lenz church rocked my world and here I am today this is why I feel that the shield of faith which represents the faith of our Lord and the faith our Lord intended us to have our faith in fact our faith in history our faith in passed on knowledge our faith in the words and actions of our Lord Jesus are so appropriate in celebrating Pastor Doug's 20 years of carrying the shield of faith. Oh man! Oh. I pulled on my notes. No, I want to go. I feel better, right? Amen. Uh, you know, I remember. Well, it was a, a long time ago when I came from the Bronx, and we were we were searching for a church. And a, a friend of my wife's said, you know, I had a dream. The Lord told me to go to this church that this was going to be your church. And I said, really? Uh, the Lord got to speak to me. But, you know, we came because we were looking for church. And I, and I looked at the church and I said, I will get caught dead in this church. <laughs> That's the truth. And I remember walking in and, um, and seeing the pastor. And I remember he was worshiping in the front. And I know this sounds weird, but it's almost like my spirit fell in love with him. And I said, wow, this guy loves the Lord. I never knew that God would bring me this point. And let me tell you, uh, you know, uh, he has a saying. I don't, I don't like the saying. He says, I'll go to hell back with him. I don't like that saying. I don't want to go to hell. But, but I, I'll walk anywhere with him. You know, and, um, you know, I love him. And, I, and I've been around some heavy hitters. But guess what? I never had a shepherd until I met my pastor. And I came here, and, and I remember there were so many things that, that I was holding on to. But little by little, God began to use him to break those things off me, to, to allow me to see truly how God saw me. And I'm a free man today because of that. And I, you know, I, I love my pastor. Listen, you have a shepherd. You have a shepherd. And for that, you know, you know I love him. And thank you, Pastor. Another 20 years for your faithfulness, for your boldness. Don't stop preaching the gospel. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'm going to pray. Hold on, everybody. Let me pray. Let me pray. Father God, I give you glory, praise, and honor. Lord, I thank you. I honor you, oh God. Thank you for this great man of God. Lord, his faith is great. His faith is so great. Sometimes I got to remind him, not everybody can handle it. He's that powerful. So, Lord, I thank you for him. I thank you for how you've guided him to, teach, to train us and to teach us and to continue to, to guide us, oh God. So, Lord, I pray a blessing over him, over his wife, over his children. Lord, I pray that you build a hedge of fire about them. Send your angels to encamp over them and continue to protect them. Thank you, Lord, 
for times such as this. So we bless you and we give you glory and we thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you. And I want to share with everybody, please, we do have some refreshments and some appetizers and we're asking everybody not to leave, to take your chair, let's come up to um, Chamberlain Hall and fellowship with us just a little bit. We won't keep you too long. Amen. Thank socially you. Distance, uh, yes, socially distance. We're going to be practicing social distancing. I just want to say thank you so much, everybody. Look at that shirt. Look at this shirt. <laughs> I rejoice in each and every one of you. I, I celebrate the time I have to laugh with you, to cry with you, to rejoice in you, to with you, and for you, and to praise the name of our Lord together. And I love doing life with you. Hallelujah. Uh, man, God is so good and he is so faithful. And I can hardly wait to see what he has coming. So guys, thank you so much. I am so honored to be your pastor and your friend.